My name is Alex Costa, a 35-year-old with a string of houses in my name in our hometown. This has been achieved through years of hard work, careful investments, and sacrifices along the way. To give some context, I come from a modest family. My parents were both blue-collar workers who labored tirelessly to provide a comfortable life for me and my siblings. They always dreamed of owning their own home, but it was beyond their reach. Their dedication ignited my ambition and fueled my determination to build a better life for myself and my family. During my college years, I met my wife. She shared similar experiences growing up, raised by a single mother who worked multiple jobs to make ends meet. From her upbringing, she learned the significance of financial prudence and resourcefulness. We both wanted to overcome financial struggles and create a stable life for our future children. Together, my wife and I bought and flipped houses over the years, saving every penny and making careful investments. Eventually, we accumulated several properties, each representing years of hard work, countless sacrifices, and a shared dream. Today, I'm a father to two wonderful kids, a son and a daughter. Our properties are not just a source of income. They symbolize our dedication to securing a future for our children. Little did I know that my life would soon take an unexpected twist, thanks to an entitled woman named Susan. Susan has been one of my tenants for a few years. She lives in a comfortable three-bedroom house that I had carefully saved for and purchased years before marrying my wife. The property is in a prime location in the city and is conveniently close to her daughter's high school. Susan, a single mother, had been abandoned by her husband shortly after their daughter was born. Learning of her situation, I offered her a subsidized rent to make it affordable for her and her daughter. Though I knew I would lose out on potential income, I wanted to help them. Over the years, I've never increased the rent, allowing it to remain the same. Susan was a reliable tenant, always paying on time, and we had developed a casual landlord-tenant relationship, occasionally keeping in touch when she needed assistance around the house. Her daughter, Jenna, is a high school senior preparing for college. Three months ago, Susan proudly informed me that Jenna had been accepted into a prestigious out-of-state university, a remarkable achievement for any student. However, this university was very expensive, and unfortunately, Jenna's scholarship barely covered 10% of her fees. I understood the financial challenges of higher education and wondered how they would manage. One day, Susan requested to meet with me. Assuming it was about some renovations needed around the house, I agreed without hesitation. We sat down in her living room, where she began by expressing her appreciation for my generosity in keeping the rent affordable. She went on to explain that she wanted Jenna to attend her dream university, but after crunching the numbers, realized the costs, including tuition, housing, and other expenses, were overwhelming. She had even reached out for financial aid, explored scholarships, and taken up a part-time job in addition to her full-time one, yet it still wasn't enough. I nodded sympathetically, expecting that she might ask to delay paying the rent for a month, which would have been understandable. Instead, Susan presented a request that left me dumbfounded. She asked if I could sell the property she was renting. I looked at her, stunned, as she explained that the money from selling this property could help fund her daughter's college education. Are you serious? I responded, a mix of astonishment and disbelief in my voice. You want me to sell my property to pay for your daughter's college tuition? Susan's eyes pleaded with me as she insisted it was her only hope to secure her daughter's future. She mentioned she had already had the entire property appraised and was confident that the sale proceeds would cover Jenna's entire college fees. I asked her if she had lost her mind because there was no way I would sell my property just for her daughter to attend a high-end university. I told her that this house meant something to me, and I wasn't going to part with it so easily. Undeterred, Susan suggested I could loan her the money and that Jenna would pay it back after graduation. While I understood the importance of a college education, I wasn't willing to accept her outrageous request. Her persistence made it clear that she was determined to fund her daughter's dreams, even if it meant making an outlandish proposition to a near stranger. I calmly explained to Susan that the property was a significant part of my livelihood and that I couldn't simply part with it. I concluded by telling her, the burden of your daughter's tuition should not fall on my shoulders, 
I told Susan that if she couldn't afford to send her daughter to that university, she could ask her family members for help or consider finding a more affordable option. Despite my attempts to make her see reason, Susan continued to press the issue, insisting that I was the only one who could help. She claimed it wouldn't be a big deal for me to sell my property and hand her the money. Realizing this was going nowhere, I left the property after firmly asking Susan never to approach me about this matter again. I requested that she recognize how unreasonable her demand was and urged her to find another way to solve her problem. I thought she might eventually realize her mistake, but over the next few weeks, Susan didn't give up. As her daughter's college journey drew closer, the situation became increasingly unbearable. Susan, despite my clear refusal, kept pleading with me daily to sell my property as soon as possible and even stopped paying her rent in protest. Our once amicable relationship had soured entirely, and the tension between us grew as Susan became more insistent, convinced that my refusal was selfish and jeopardizing her daughter's future. Meanwhile, I was losing income due to her refusal to pay rent in protest. I warned her that I would take this to court since we had an ironclad agreement, but she remained defiant and it became clear her demands had no end. The turning point came when Susan began involving others in our dispute. She started approaching her friends and neighbors, portraying me as an unsympathetic landlord who refused to help a young girl realize her dreams. She told them that, although I was very wealthy, I refused to loan her the money. Given her status as a single mother struggling to make ends meet, her story garnered sympathy from those she confided in. Susan took it a step further by airing her grievances on social media. She posted on Facebook, blaming me for her daughter's inability to attend college, which quickly circulated in our neighborhood. People began sympathizing with her plight, assuming I was indeed capable of helping but was choosing not to. It was a surreal experience, feeling like an outsider in my own community. With tension in the neighborhood mounting, my wife decided to reach out to Susan hoping a direct conversation might resolve the conflict. However, Susan wasn't interested in a calm discussion. She launched into a tirade, accusing me of having the means to sell the property, which she saw as the only way to secure her daughter's future. Despite my wife's sincere attempts to reason with her, Susan's conviction remained unshaken. She repeatedly asserted that we had the means to fund her daughter's college education and were being selfish by refusing. Susan's social media post, painting me as an unsympathetic and wealthy landlord who refused to help, had a noticeable impact on our neighbors. Some who had previously been friendly began viewing us with skepticism, believing that I was indeed capable of alleviating her daughter's financial burdens but was choosing not to out of selfishness. Fortunately, others who knew the reality of my situation and the hard work I had invested shared my perspective. They were equally appalled by Susan's audacious demand and reminded me of the importance of protecting the legacy I had built. As the community became more divided, Susan continued to fan the flames, accusing me of lacking empathy and exploiting her by allowing her to live in my property rent-free. Her social media posts became more vocal, sharing exaggerated stories of her daughter's determination and the sacrifices she claimed to have made to prepare for college. The situation escalated from a private disagreement to a public spectacle. The weight of the allegations began affecting my family as well. My children started experiencing bullying at school, with classmates parroting the false claims they had seen on social media about me. Watching the distress this situation caused my family was heartbreaking, and I knew I had to act. I had hoped Susan would eventually stop, but now that my children were suffering, it was time to set the record straight and defend my integrity. I reached out to a lawyer who specialized in property disputes and landlord-tenant conflicts. Together, we drafted a cease and desist letter to end Susan's defamatory actions and protect my standing within the community. My lawyer explained that the letter was the first step in our legal battle, and if Susan didn't back down, we would pursue the matter in court. When Susan received the letter, she was understandably shocked. She attempted to reach out to me by phone, but I chose not to answer her calls. Instead, she sent me a text message, expressing her desire to talk and clear this up before things went too far. She claimed it was all a huge misunderstanding and suggested we could discuss it to resolve the issue. I replied, 
stating firmly that my intention was to take her to court if she continued her campaign against me. I told Susan to brace herself and enjoy it because she would soon regret ever trying to mess with me. I knew this was going to be an uphill fight. This woman had been relentless in insisting that I pay her daughter's tuition, damaging my family's reputation both in the community and online. My lawyer is preparing our case for trial if she refuses to back down, outlining all the false accusations and the harm she's caused us over the last few months. When some of my relatives heard I was taking her to court, they suggested giving her a chance to settle the matter amicably, citing that she's a single mother trying to do the best for her child. So, Reddit, am I the villain here for refusing to sell my property to pay this entitled mom's daughter's college fees and instead taking her to court? Susan responded to our legal action with a letter filled with threats and more defamatory claims. She accused me of charging high rent, knowing her financial struggles, which she claimed made it impossible for her to save for her daughter's education. I can't believe how low she's willing to go, stooping to outright lies to get her way. Her accusations are entirely baseless, and it's incredibly frustrating to see her play the victim when I had provided her with a subsidized rent all these years. It's clear she's trying to manipulate the situation in her favor, and I'm not about to let that happen. My lawyer, Brian assured me that we have a strong case since her accusations are groundless, but he also warned me to be prepared for a long, draining legal process. I can't help but think about how quickly this situation spiraled. It was never my intention to end up in a courtroom with a tenant, but sometimes you have to stand your ground to protect what's rightfully yours. Susan might have her reasons, but I can't allow her to pressure me into selling my property. My family's future is at stake, and I'm determined to see this through no matter how challenging it gets. The legal proceedings have begun, and the anticipation leading up to the court date was excruciating. The courtroom was charged with tension as both parties presented their arguments and evidence. Susan, flanked by her attorney, portrayed herself as a struggling mother determined to secure her daughter's future. Her attorney painted a vivid picture of her financial hardships, emphasizing how my property was supposedly her daughter's last hope for attending the prestigious out-of-state university. Susan's testimony was laced with emotion. Her eyes welled up with tears as she described the sacrifices she had made as a single mother, the long hours she worked and her relentless pursuit of financial aid and scholarships. She painted herself as a mother who had left no stone unturned in her daughter's journey to success. Throughout the proceedings, Susan's attorney relentlessly tried to paint me as a wealthy, unsympathetic landlord who prioritized profit over a young girl's dreams. They implied that I had been fully aware of Susan's financial struggles yet continued to exploit her with high rent. But the most astonishing twist came when Susan introduced a witness, a family friend, who claimed to have overheard a conversation in which I allegedly promised to sell the property to finance her daughter's college education. I sat in disbelief as this blatant falsehood was presented. My attorney, Brian, vehemently challenged the claim, asserting that no such conversation ever took place. He took a methodical approach, cross-examining the so-called witness to highlight the gaps and inconsistencies in their story. Brian asked the friend to specify the date, time, and location of this alleged conversation, hoping to expose the inconsistencies or gaps in their recollection. The family friends struggled under scrutiny, unable to provide consistent details or any concrete evidence, such as texts or emails, to support their claim. Their testimony became increasingly shaky under cross-examination. To further undermine Susan's case, Brian presented records of texts and emails between Susan and me during the period when the alleged promise was said to have occurred. These messages clearly showed that the topic of selling my property to fund her daughter's education was never discussed. Instead, they revealed that Susan was the one persistently urging me to sell my property. Additionally, a neighbor who lived next to Susan's property testified that she had been paying significantly less rent than others in the area. My lawyer even brought in rent receipts from other tenants in the neighborhood to prove this point. Brian argued that the absence of any written or electronic communication regarding Susan's claims, combined with the neighbor's testimony, cast serious doubt on the family friend's account, making it inadmissible as concrete evidence. We then shifted our focus to Susan's actions on social media. 
Brian presented a comprehensive record of Susan's posts and messages, where she accused me of being an unsympathetic and heartless landlord who refused to support her daughter's dreams. These posts were filled with emotional appeals and outright falsehoods, clearly designed to gain sympathy and support from the community. We emphasized that these posts were intentionally crafted to create a narrative that painted Susan as a struggling mother doing everything possible for her child's future. When, in reality, she was emotionally blackmailing me to sell my property. Brian then introduced screenshots of social media comments and direct messages from individuals who had engaged with Susan's posts. Some of these individuals were part of the local community and had formed a negative opinion of me based on the false information presented by Susan. These comments ranged from expressions of sympathy for her plight to outright accusations that I was an unfeeling landlord exploiting her situation. In addition to the social media evidence, we presented witness testimonies from my children who had experienced bullying at their school due to Susan's social media posts. They described how their classmates had echoed the false claims they had read online about their father, leading to name-calling and harassment. My attorney went on to argue that there was a direct connection between Susan's false accusations on social media and the bullying my children had endured. The intentionally misleading narrative she had crafted had not only damaged my reputation but also directly affected my family's well-being. This presentation of evidence effectively showed how Susan's actions on social media led to real-life consequences for my children. As the legal proceedings continue, I am confident that justice will be served. The evidence presented so far has shed light on the truth and exposed the false claims made against me. I believe that the court will see through the manipulation and ensure a fair outcome in this case. The past month has been a grueling experience due to the legal proceedings. It has been like a roller coaster ride with unexpected twists and turns. My lawyer continued to present evidence and testimonies, which made it increasingly clear that Susan's claims were baseless. Her attempt to manipulate the situation by introducing a family friend who falsely testified about a promise I had never made fell apart under scrutiny. The lack of concrete evidence and inconsistencies in the witness's account cast doubt on the validity of their claims. After a thorough examination of all the evidence and testimonies, the judge finally announced the verdict and ruled in my favor. This came as a huge relief to me, and I was grateful that the judge had seen through all the baseless claims. Susan was found guilty of defamation and was ordered to pay damages for the harm she had caused to my reputation, starting with paying the rent for the previous months and additional fines. A restraining order was also issued by the judge, preventing Susan from making any further defamatory statements about me or my family. This ruling successfully validated my actions and my right to protect my property. As the legal battle concluded, I watched Susan sitting beside her lawyer, looking defeated. I turned to look at her daughter, Jenna, and couldn't shake off the thought that her dreams had been compromised by her mother's sense of entitlement. This nightmare was finally coming to an end, with justice being served. It was a lesson for everyone on the importance of defending oneself and not letting someone else's audacious demands shake our core beliefs. I can now move forward with a renewed sense of self-assurance and the knowledge that my house and our livelihood are secure. I would like to thank everyone who has supported me on this journey. The mental pressure and struggles my family and I went through were immense, but ultimately, the truth prevailed. It has been six months since my courtroom victory. The restraining order has effectively silenced Susan, and the damages she had to pay for defamation provided some level of consolation for the harm done to my reputation. Susan and her daughter had to move out after I gave them the eviction notice. While their circumstances remain challenging, I knew they were no longer my responsibility. I did feel a twinge of sympathy for her daughter's lost educational opportunities, but the reality was that her mother's audacious request had put their family in a difficult situation. Susan was also forced to take down her defamatory social media posts as part of the court's ruling, and everyone quickly found out the extent of her lies. The last I heard about them was when her daughter, Jenna, reached out to me with an apology out of nowhere. Jenna had always been a great kid, and I had watched her grow up, but when her mother started falsely alleging things about me, I cut off contact with them. I was surprised that she wanted to get in touch with me after her mother publicly lost the case. Her message was filled with genuine remorse for the way her mother had behaved and the consequences that had befallen her family as a result. 
She expressed gratitude for our patience and understanding during the ordeal, recognizing that her mother's actions had caused harm to both our families. She also shared that they had relocated to a more affordable area and that she had decided to attend a local college to pursue her education. She informed me that she had spoken with her mother after the legal proceedings ended and had asked her to back off, stating that she was determined to secure her own future without making any audacious demands. I felt sympathy for what she had to go through at such an early age because of her entitled mother's false claims. I told her that everyone deserves a second chance, and it was admirable that she was taking control of her own destiny. I wished her the best of luck with her studies and assured her that the past was behind us. Now that Susan and her daughter no longer live on my property, our life has settled into a new normal. The weight of the false accusations and the bullying our children faced earlier has been lifted. We took action by reaching out to our children's school and addressing the bullying they had gone through.